falling for the China trap, President Nasheed. It didn't happen during your tenure. Why is it happening now? Well, firstly, um, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be back in Delhi, uh, back in India. Um, I've been away from India for far too long. It's been six months. Uh, uh, this business of a former president is an awkward affair. You can't just go to places. You have to be invited to come. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, the editor-in-chief, and thank you to the whole team. I love it here. I've always said, um, I am a friend of India, and the vast majority of the people of the Maldives are friends of India. This is a very, very wrong perception that there is an anti-Indian sentiment in the Maldives. There is, we do not have an anti-Indian sentiment in the Maldives. It's a small minority of people who, for their political benefit, have coined a phrase and have gone with this rhetoric. So, but before coming to your question, as you pointed out, I immensely admire your Prime Minister, Prime, Honorable Prime Minister Modi, and the work that the Prime Minister is doing. It is not only lifting the people of India to prosperity. It is giving a source of strength and honor and proudness to all of us. We want to rise with India. We want to plug into your development. We want to have prosperity in our islands, in, in the neighbor, and whatever good happens here will overflow to our neighbors, to your neighbors, and therefore, it is very important for us that India keeps on rising. I have no doubt that this will ever stop. The coming decade would certainly be the decade for India. Now, coming to your question, why has the Maldives signed a defense agreement with China? To start with, uh, I have my doubts if they have actually signed anything other than a supply contract. In 1988, there was an attempted coup in the Maldives. India instantly stepped in, aborted the coup, and brought back the government again. Every time when there has been a defense or a security issue in the Maldives, it's been India who has come to our assistance. The number of defense agreements and military exercises that our, we jointly have are far more than anyone else can ever have. So it's unfortunate that the Maldives has thought, or the president has thought, that he needs to buy tear gas and rubber bullets from China. And I am afraid that this will be again used against us. So uh, this is not something that I would ever celebrate. Uh, I think stronger democracy, rule of law, is how you govern, not through the barrel of the gun. So the, whatever equipment that we have bought, is unnecessary, and I hope that they will remain unnecessary. And the institutional links between our two countries are far stronger than just one equipment contract. President Nasheed, uh, you know, now Muizu, right? He's come to power with an anti-India sentiment. He's, uh, uh, he, he came to power with the India Out campaign, right? But is that the Maldivian sentiment? Is that what the people of Maldives feel? I, first, I do not believe that he has come to power because of an anti-India rhetoric. He, he came to power because my old party was weak. Uh, our sitting president was weak. Our party was fractured. We couldn't unify the party. And we went into a presidential election thinking very, that uh, they could win without, with a one section of our party. So it was very unfortunate that this had happened. Uh, Anti-India sentiment is not a Maldives sentiment. We have to, I have to stress this again and again and again. We, as I keep saying, we read the same books, we watch the same films, we eat the same food, we have similar cultures, and we are very, very united. We are the same people. You cannot divorce us. You cannot marginalize us from India. And I, I never would believe that a sensible thinking Maldivian would ever believe that 
there can be any political gain by having an Indian sentiment. All of, most of our doctors are Indians. Most of our teachers are Indians. Most of our accountants are Indians. The middle establishment is very much assisted by India. So it is foolhardy for us to think, outrageous for us to, for anyone to think that, that an anti-India sentiment is a Maldive sentiment. I've come here at a very yeah. difficult time. Yes. Uh, and especially uh, having to sit with journalists like, you know, high-flying journalists like you. So you're not high-flying, sir. And, and trying to defend, trying to bat it out would be, I know, difficult. Uh, but I, I really do want to uh, say that this is not a Maldives sentiment. We are your friends and we will continue and remain as your friends. Fantastic. So when, when, when for example, uh, Muizu says there will be no Indian troops on Maldivian soil, he said that. He's given a deadline of May 15th, if I'm not wrong. He says, I, I think there are roughly about 89 Indian troops in Maldives as of today. And when he says on the 15th of May, there will be no Indian troops in, uh, you know, military uniform or in civilian clothes. How long do you think it's going to last? Well, we have three Indian helicopters and one Donia flight. Will he, will he return those helicopters? We have, we have three. We still have three Indian helicopters. Yes. And one Donia flight. These were brought uh, to, for medical evacuation. When our people uh, get ill in our far-flung islands, these helicopters bring the patients to our hospitals. We have few developed hospitals. So these are in few islands. So to, to have medical emergency evacuations, India has helped us to bring these people to hospitals. And they have benefited our, our people immensely. They have alleviated a lot of pain. And I believe that they should continue and they will continue. Now, but President Moise kind of feels that there has to be another mechanism through which they would like to bring them. I personally don't believe that this should happen. He wants civilian uh, Indian personnel to do the job. The whole idea even from the very beginning was that they would train our people to do the work and they would remain until the training was done. And I think we should continue with that. And I believe that we will continue with that. Uh, I can't see this rapidly changing in the near future. But, but you, see, you, you see the kind of statements that are coming out, President Nasheed. For example, uh, there was a recent statement where he called India a bully. I mean, I can't imagine a Maldivian head of state called India a bully. Why would you do that? You have, uh, you've had our external affairs minister, Mr. S. Jay Shankar, who gave him a befitting reply. And he said, uh, while responding to that statement, he said, uh, a bully, a bully in the neighborhood wouldn't give you four and a half billion dollars in aid, right? Well, I'll add to what Dr. Jayashankar said. When little Maldives asked India that they would want the troops gone, you know what India did? They agreed. There was no muscle twisting, muscle display. There was no arm twisting. They just wanted to have a conversation find out how this can reasonably be done. That's not an action of a bully. An actions of a bully would be to display your muscle. Of course, you do have you, far more, more stronger than anyone around in our region, or for that matter, the planet. That's not what India did. What India did was they respected a small island nation for whatever right or wrong, they respected it, spoke to them, they are speaking to them, and they are finding ways of how to hand over. And I believe this, uh, these are actions of a responsible superpower. These are not actions of a bully. Money is just one thing, but how you act, how you behave, how you treat your small neighbor, that is, how, that is where a definition of bullying would come. And you would never see that. You know, if you go back to the 70s and 60s and, and the United States and their neighbors and what was happening there, you would see the difference. Here is a responsible superpower rising and I, I, I like it. I want to see India rise. And I, I strongly believe 
that our safety and our security is linked. Yes, the $4.5 billion, the uh, COVID vaccine, uh, the 1988 coup, when we had water storage, water shortage, uh, India also came with water. So there's numerous incidents when India has always come and helped us out. And I don't think these are actions of a bully. That's very wrong to say it. Yeah. No one should say it. And I will condemn this all the time. And when you speak of bullies, how would you describe China? Would you call China a bully or would you call China uh, or refer to China as, as, as a honey trap? I'll tell you why. Because see what's happened to Sri Lanka and you have friends in Sri Lanka. See what has happened to Nepal. What they're trying to do in uh, Bangladesh, for example, and in Bhutan, right? Now, all of them are wary of China today. Why is Maldives suddenly taken this still? You know, uh, the, throughout the region, we swing from one side to another after every election. This is a habit. And, but we must try and see that we have stable foreign policy, where we have more center and keep, not keep on swinging from one side to the other. But this, this is happening. Uh, it's part and parcel of multi-party democracy. If I say it's white, my opposition would instantly come out and say it's black. So there is that element to it as well. Uh, uh, but China has spent a lot of, given a lot of aid, loans, not aid, loans, to our countries to build a lot of infrastructure. Now, I do not think that we should measure development with concrete. The more concrete, the more steel you have, the more glass you have, that doesn't necessarily mean you are developing more. They intentionally raise the price of the projects so that the business plan fails. When the business plan fails, you can't pay back your loan. So when you can't pay back the loan, then they ask for equity. And with equity, we lose more sovereignty. So I think uh, the, the, this whole idea that development depends on huge amounts of infrastructure is very wrong. Development is what happens to you. It's your own prosperity and it's your own happiness. So I, I think if you, when, when countries want to counter the road and belt initiative, it's not another road and belt initiative. It must be focused on small projects that have big impact on households, on people. And I think uh, a lot of the Indian, Indian projects in the Maldives are driven in this way. I've had many uh, conversations with your officials, and they do agree that this is the best way to go about assisting uh, a neighboring country. And, uh, and I believe that you know, we are very heavily indebted uh, all of our countries are very, very heavily indebted. And this year, more than I, I am told, that more up to 25 to 30 countries would go into default. Poor countries, developing countries, have to pay over $500 billion in interest alone to all these loans. We don't have that money because none of these projects were actually financially viable. So it is going to be a difficult year. There will be more defaults, and there will be more chaos all around us. So it's going to be sad, and I, I think we should be very, very mindful about where the money is coming from, how the money is spent, what are the terms of these investments. Uh, and I am very glad that you know, Indian investments go through a tendering process. Yes. And we know what is coming to our country. It's not just uh, uh, some... A vanity project for a minister. It's, it's done through enough assessments and it's, it's going through a process. And the rates are very, very low. So these are development loans. And the price is the best price. So I think there is a marked difference between what we get from India and what we get from China. I would go for Indian assistance any day. Great. Well said. I mean, uh, w once Maldives default, I think uh, the tide will change. And the tide will change. And it, we, we also know it's a fight for the Indian Ocean. Of course, India has a stake in the Indian Ocean, right? China has an interest in the Indian Ocean. Now, well, is, I, I wanted to ask you, 
because I was speaking to you uh, just before this, and you, you mentioned that the current president of Maldives is running out of support. Is that true? Is he isolated? Is there a chance that the government could fall in the Maldives? Well, uh, he came, uh, he won the elections, as I said, A, because uh, uh, our party got fractured and the president was very weak. B, because the former president, President Yamin, and the breakaway from the MDP also supported him. But now all of these people have left him. His own party is fractured where President Yamin has distanced himself from the new president. And no one is around him. So he is, he is looking very, very isolated. We have parliamentary elections coming. And I think these elections would show uh, how the political landscape would look like. And uh, I, am, I am hopeful I, and I am very confident that we will be able to bring sanity to the Maldives. Sensible people will do sensible things. And we can't go along this trajectory and this pathway. It will change. Yep. Now, about the Indian Ocean. Yes. The Maldives occupies the navigable parts of the Indian Ocean. We are a very big country. We are a big ocean state. We, we stretch 1,000 kilometers from north to south. Most of the trade routes and supply lines converge into our, our, our space and our country. So there is always people who want to dominate the Maldives. And we should always be mindful about that. And because of this, safety and security of the Indian Ocean is so important for all of, all of us. India is very relevant for us, and we must, we must have good relations with India. I believe these are the sensible paths that we should take, and I think it will continue. You know, uh, we have a very, our, our prime minister here is very popular, you know. Uh, he likes to dive, he likes to snorkel. And why was there such a meltdown in Maldives when our prime minister went to Lakshadweep? Why did your politicians lose it? At least a set of them. I, they lost it on social media. They put out uh, posts, I mean, uh, bordering on hate, right? Why did they go into a meltdown? Well, I'm, you know, small minds do wrong things. Uh, developing tourism in Luxadeep would be for the benefit of the Maldives. It's complementary. It's never competitive. When, when Sri Lanka grows, when Sri Lankan tourist, tourism prospers, it's always a benefit to the, to the Maldives. Someone who is going to Luxadeep is more likely to come to the Maldives as well because you've been there and there is another destination right next door. So very often people take these multiple uh, destination tours. So I, I, I think it was wrong even economically. We've known, we've understood this about Maldives, Maldives tourism industry and how it helps when Sri Lanka Sri Lankan arrivals increase, Maldives arrivals will increase. So I think a, a, a tourism development in Luxembourg would benefit us all. There, there is nothing wrong with having tourism in the Luxembourg and it would be beautiful. I am sure it can be done. And I believe a lot of our own entrepreneurs, because they have a very good experience on developing resorts, they probably have better experience in this region in developing resorts, and they would jump to the occasion. Yes. Uh, they already have uh, resorts in Seychelles. They already have resorts in Zanzibar. So I am sure our entrepreneurs would jump to the occasion, and they do want this. They've been wanting tourism development in Minico Islands as well. So uh, I think, A, to start with, this was wrongly thinking, and it was small minds talking about silly things. Uh, uh, and I'm glad that these uh, low-level government officials have now been removed. And these are activists who suddenly was brought into government, and then uh, they just kind of ran on the wrong side. Sad, and I am sorry. Yeah. I am extremely Why sorry that they have done that? this. Now that, that's, that's you know, it's, it's graceful of you. But is it true that tourism industry has actually taken a, taken a hit? It because has. of the boycott by, by Indians. Well, yes, uh, uh, Indian, a, a lot of Indian tourists have stopped coming to the Maldives. And even if the aggregate number remains, we must understand that 
Resorts specialize in destinations. There'll be resorts who specialize in Indian tourists. And for them, it would be a very, very big hit. Uh, so the boycott campaign here has hurt us. And again, I'm, I've come here to tell you, please come to the Maldives. And you must win our hearts and our minds. They are with you. To hit us back is, I am sure that's not the view of the Honorable Prime Minister. I know the Honorable Prime Minister very well. I'll tell you, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but Lila, my wife, when she asked the Prime Minister not to come to the Maldives while I was in prison, the Prime Minister not only not came to the Maldives, but got me out as well. So I, have, uh, uh, I can go on saying so many instances and, and uh, our relationship with the Honorable Prime Minister is very rich, very friendly, and I am sure it will continue. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, finally, you know, I, I had a classmate. I had a few classmates when I studied in Bangalore, a city uh, in Karnataka. And, uh, you know, they're back in the Maldives, and some of them are in the, you know, the tourism business. And they tell me it started with India out, but the mood now is Muizu out. Is that true? Is that, is, is that going to happen? Well, you see, when you go against entrepreneurship, when you actually hurt your own people, it will be difficult to win their hearts. It will be difficult to get their support. So I, 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 I think uh, the uh, president, Dr. Moise, would realize what has happened, and he will have to change course, uh, redirect himself, and see that we remain strongly together. This is not the path that we should take. All right, he's traveled all the way from Ghana in Africa to be with us at the Republic Summit this year, and he's going back to Ghana after this, so big round of applause for President I, 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 there's, there's one more little thing, yeah. right. Uh, going to the topic, what should India do in the coming decade? India, I believe, will save the planet. Uh, I am very sorry, you know, this hasn't come up here. We have to decarbonize. We have to find a low carbon development strategy that would give us the same economic outcomes, but without damaging the planet. The biofuels that your energy minister was talking about, I was very excited about it. The renewables that you are bringing, your net zero targets. So India, will be the leader in saving the planet. That is bigger than anything else. So I believe what India would do in the next 10 years, decade, would be actually find a pathway to save the planet. And I thank you for that. President Rashid, thank you for joining us here at the Republic Summit. It was a pleasure to host you. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for President thank Rashid. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for being so candid and insightful. Ladies and gentlemen, the former president of the Maldives, Mohammed Nasheed. It's time now for a virtual interaction with an individual who has dared to scale. His style of entrepreneurship has been a source of inspiration to many. He has successfully powered his vision to scale with the restless passion to adapt to evolving trends. He's been a big believer in green and clean energy in industry, championing sustainability and environmental responsibility every step of the way. Through his visionary leadership, he has spearheaded initiatives to reduce carbon footprints, promote renewable energy sources, and drive towards a greener future for our planet. He has delivered on aggressive acquisitions, strategically expanding reach and influence in key markets while maintaining a steadfast commitment to working on the larger goal of building a robust Bharat. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the founder and chairperson of the RPSG Group, Mr. Sanjeev Goenka, the man of ideas who is scaling up with solidity and purpose steering us towards growth and prosperity with unwavering determination and vision.
India and Indians is unparalleled. It's not only given the world a new confidence in India, a new respect for India, a new respect for Indians, but it's given all of us within India, every Indian, the confidence and belief that we can perform, we can deliver, we can compete. The BJP government has changed the way one operated in India. And it's become so much easier to think global, genuinely think global scales, to manufacture in India, to operate in India, and to grow from India. I must say that uh, we've recently, over the last few years, invested a lot in Uttar Pradesh. And I've been blown away by what I see of what's happening in Uttar Pradesh and uh, the leadership provided by Yogi Ji. It's absolutely fantastic. Prime Minister Modi is the boss.